our two o'clock workshop. This is, uh, what is this workshop? Home education, is it a right? Yes, I think. I would like to, um, I would like to bring up my fellow panelists, please. We're gonna have a discussion. So if I could have uh, Dr. Richter, Dr. DeGroof. No, there's no translation in here. The translation, only translation upstairs in New York or in uh, California. I'm sorry, we only have two workshops that are translated, so there will be no Portuguese speaking allowed. <laughs> oh, without translation, okay. Um, so I would like to introduce, I'll introduce my, my guests um, here for our conversation. Is home education a right? So, um, Alexandre Moreira, we know, uh, is, is um, a deputy legal counsel in the Brazilian government. He serves uh, also as legal counsel for the Associato Nacional do Educacho Domiciliar. How is that? Not too bad. The Brazilian Homeschool Association, ANED. Uh, he holds an LLM in law from Vanderbilt University and is a professor of criminal and administrative law. Please come join me. Um, I would like to also welcome my friend and colleague, uh, if I can find him in here. Let's see, today's, what's today, Thursday? Here we go. Professor Dr. Ingo Richter is a law professor at Berlin Free University and Hamburg University, and also has taught at Stanford University, Hastings Law University of Chicago, Smith College, Bordeaux, and Tunis, and is currently teaching in Paris. Um, he uh, is a member in several educational reform commissions, or has been a member of several educational reform commissions, is the past director of the German Youth Institute Munich, uh, and current editor of the journal Recht der Jugend und des Bildungswesen. How was that? He is uh, good enough. He is the author of numerous books and articles on constitutional law and educational law and holds a doctorate in law from Hamburg uh, and in Paris. He was, he's from Western Germany, but of course there is no Western Germany. There's only one Germany. Maybe not, he's, he's not so sure. Please, please join us, Dr. Professor Dr. Richter. <clears throat> uh, you're a professor, Jan, yes? You are a professor also. You're teaching at Tilburg, yeah? Yeah, yeah, okay. Professor Dr. Jan de Roof, is that right? Good. Holds the UNESCO Chair for the Right to Education and is a former UNESCO Charge de Mission. He is founder and president of the European Association for Education, Law, and Policy uh, and has chaired both the World, Con World Conferences on Human Dignity, the Right to and Rights in Education, He's uh, been chief of the cabinet of the Flemish Ministry of Education and Training, is a government commissioner for universities in the Flemish community of Belgium, uh, has degrees in law, canon law, and religious studies, and recently received his doctorate, honoris causa of Pretoria University. Uh, and we are very, very privileged to have Professor Dr. Jan de Roof with us today. Please, Jan, please come up and, and join us. We'll be having a conversation. Please welcome Dr. de Roof. Now, we, we have uh, some very, uh, we have a, a nice group here gathered, um, but we are also uh, have a future audience that we are recording. So we're gonna have a conversation about home education, is it a right? Uh, I'm, my name is Mike Donnelly. For those who are um, watching and have never seen or heard of me before, I am the Director for Global um, Outreach at the Homeschool Legal Defense Association, which is the world's largest homeschool advocacy organization. Um, I uh, also am a professor of gov government at Patrick Henry College. I'm uh, also about to get my LLM in international human rights law from the London School of Economics. Um, I serve as a staff attorney for our members, uh, HSLDA members in eight states. Um, and uh, I'm glad to be here. Okay, so we have, um, uh, we're starting a little bit late, but that's okay. Uh, and uh, we'll have a break in a little while. Before the break, I'll try to remember to make the announcements I'm supposed to, re to make. Um, the conversation that I would like to have 
um, among these these distinguished jur- jurists, and I, I I mostly referring to these three guys, not so much myself, but these three guys. Um, is about home education as a right, and I want to use the Rio principles as, as our sort of discussion framework. Um, Alexandri is the principal author of the Rio principles. I helped with it. Um, it's, a, it's been declared by our conference here. Um, do you have a copy over there, Ingo? Here, go give, give it to him. Give it to him. Yeah, well, we're going to be using it. Uh, does, so if you have a copy, and we'd like to invite you to participate in our conversation today. Um, this is new, brand new, the real principles, um, and if you need a copy, go ahead and, and take one. You, everyone was given a copy, uh, so it, it will bring it back or find someone who doesn't have it. <laughs> um, th- I just want to read a little bit out of the introduction uh, and just go through a little bit, and then hopefully that will spark some discussion. Uh, because I have, I, I take the position that home education is a human right. Um, it may not be explicit in any human rights documents, but it is, I think, fully implicit in the synthesis of human rights, the human rights framework. Uh, and so that's the position that I take, and I'd like to have a conversation uh, with my friends here about that. So, um, so we are recognizing uh, the Universal Declaration of Human, human Rights recognizes the right to education and the purpose for it and what education is for. Um, on the third paragraph, the state can provide educational opportunity, but only the person can develop the capacity available through education. So it cannot be forced. Education cannot be forced is the point. Uh, it can only be received. It cannot be forced. Uh, the state must respect the person, the family, and the cultural context, and the right of the individual and of peoples to self-determination. Um, as demonstrated by uh, the history of the 20th century, the lack of such respect easily leads to the abuse of state power, which can transform compulsory education into compulsory totalitarian ideological indoctrination, which destroys rather than develops the human personality. Um, to avoid the repetition of that sorrowful decla- disregard and contempt for human rights which have resulted in barbarous acts which have outraged the conscience of mankind, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights intentionally and solemnly proclaimed that parents have a prior right to choose the kind of education that shall be given to their children. And so I would say, and I hope we can discuss this, that respect to this fundamental right of the family and education is therefore the necessary prerequisite, bold claim there, necessary prerequisite for a genuinely free and democratic society. So we have a couple of questions here. Is home education a human right? Um, Is it a prerequisite for a genuinely free and democratic society? Um, So in the Rio principles, um, what we tried to do was to reflect the existing state of international human rights law as it relates to issues of home education. Uh, we have, this document affirms binding international legal standards with which all states must comply. And when you open the Rio, stand, the Rio principles, and, and for those who um, are participating via the Internet, uh, the Rio principles is available at therioprinciples.org. Um, and we have ten principles, which all lead to um, the view that home education is a human right. And I won't go through all of them, but I'll just list. We have principle one, human dignity. Principle two, best interest of the child. Principle three, the protection of the family. Uh, Recognizing that the family is the fundamental unit of society entitled to protection by the state. And you see references to various human rights documents all throughout the, um, through the principles. And they're not exhaustive, nor is this comprehensive. Uh, There are many more human rights documents that could have been referred to and in fact do support these, these, all of these principles. All these principles are fully uh, taken from, uh, you know, accepted human rights principles. Principle four, the impartial state. Uh, Principle five, respect for difference. Principle six, freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. Um, uh, Erwin Fabiano Garcia Lopez, who is not here, made a point of this in his plenary talk this morning that, uh, you know, putting this up to and, and to have interaction between this principle uh, as well as the, the principle of parental rights, which is principle eight. We also have principle seven, cultural rights. Principle nine, the right to education, uh, which is in many, many documents there is discussed the right to education. And finally, 
principle 10, which I will read, which is the right to home education. So we say in the real principles, the right to home education is the fundamental right of families, children, and parents clearly derived from all the above mentioned rights and implied by them, especially by the freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, cultural rights, and parental rights. Therefore, the duty of states to respect and ensure this right is a necessary part of their obligations according to, the univer to universal human rights standards. So, we say, states shall explicitly recognize in their internal legislation the right of all parents to freely choose home education for their children. States shall respect and protect the freedom of the parents to choose the pedagogical approach in home education. States shall not interfere in home education except in cases of a serious violation of child's rights that causes or caused substantial harm and which have been justly proven after due process of law. States shall prevent any discrimination with regard to access to the higher education and employment on the ground of education choice, including choice of home education. Finally, states shall protect the freedom to engage in home education at any time without undue burden on the children or the parents. So that is, that is the real principles. It is signed by a number of distinguished uh, persons as well as, uh, well, I guess all persons are distinguished by our humanity uh, and are all due to uh, individual dis dignity and respect. So, but we do have some, uh, some experts who have signed this, including uh, our keynote speaker for tomorrow, Professor Sugata Mitra, Dr. Deborah Bell, uh, Dr. Rogerio Mugnani, um, Michael Ferris, uh, JD, myself, JD, Alexandre Manuel Morera, uh, LLM, and Lindert Van Oostrom, who is a master's. Um, and there are numbers of other people here, so I just mentioned the ones who have the, 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 the alphabets, af alphabet soup after the end of their name. Uh, you can read all of these principles. I encourage you to do so. I encourage you to share them. I encourage you to uh, share it on your Facebook page, tweet it, uh, you know, let other people know about it. Are they tra they're not translating me, are they? No, I didn't think so. There's no translation. I'm sorry. There's, for those of you who are expecting translation, no translation in here. I'm sorry. Okay. So we've just kind of gone a run through here. Um, now, we'll, if we have time, and I'll, be tr I'll try to corral our discussion here because th these, these are very... You know, these guys have a lot to say, I'm sure. Um, so, but we'd love to get some in, interaction with you as well. So as we go through this conversation, if you have a point you'd like to make or a question, I'd ask you to jot it down. and Just jot down your question on a piece of paper, and I will try to work it into the, uh, into this, into the discussion. You've got some pens and paper there. Uh, if possible, we could just write it down. I think that will be the most efficient way to do this if we can do that. Okay. I'd like to, I'd like to if you don't mind, Ingo, I'd like to ask you first for your reaction to what I've just said, to your thoughts about the Rio principles. Uh, now, I will just say the ground rules here are you're free to criticize, to disagree, uh, uh, have different opinions, and I, I know he will, um, and to uh, point out flaws. This is an open discussion here. We want to have a very robust uh, discourse on this question because it is not clearly established, although I think it's clearly implicit. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mike. It's working, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Um, first, I want to say that <clears throat> my name is Richter, and Richter is judge in German, <laughs> but I'm not sitting on the Karlsruhe court, and I never were because of my age, of course. Um, and so, uh, although I'm not responsible for this jurisdiction. Uh, in a way, I can say I could feel here like in the lion's den coming from Germany, <laughs> where home education is not permitted, like in Sweden and might be in a way also in some other countries. And uh, so um, I hope you will not eat me up. <laughs> That's why I said you're welcome to disagree, and uh, this is a very open yeah. forum. Um, for the moment, I have three points. Uh, the first point is a question. Uh, why did you choose for the declaration uh, these real principles, uh, the 
Universal Declaration of 48. Because the UN Declaration of Human Rights of 48 is not international law, it's a political declaration, and this is recognized in international law, there is no disagreement about that. And there are other declarations uh, which are recognized as international law, like the two declarations of 66, 1966, and particularly the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. So my point is the foundation for homeschooling in international law would be much better founded if you choose one of the other real international law declarations of human rights. Uh, second point is, uh, it is sometimes easy to say, so and so is a human right. That's only 50% of the story, because human rights, ca as all rights, can be restricted by the states, by, because of the sovereignty of the states. And so, if we say uh, home education is a human right, uh, of the parents and the human rights, particularly of the child, as I particularly do, then we have also to look at the restrictions. And these restrictions are in the UN declarations on human rights. For instance, in the 89 Declaration uh, of the Rights of the Child, in uh, Article 28, it's worded explicitly that the right to education of the child is fulfilled by compulsory education, without any exception. So this is human rights law, and we have to handle this. Uh, so this was my second point, and I'd like a discussion how to handle these uh, problems. I have to make some suggestions on this, by the way, uh, to permit your, uh, home education. And the third point is, um, my particular interest here is the rights of the child, because when you look at the literature, it's full of statements on the rights of the parents. The parents, the parents, that's all right. But what about the child? And we have now the uh, Human Rights Declaration of the Rights of the Child. And uh, as Jan said this morning, uh, the art of handling homeschooling is like private schools, like parents' rights and so on, is to balance the rights of the children, the rights of the parents, the state responsibility, and the rights of the community, of the others. That's well, we are off to an excellent start already. I'm so glad that you made the trip here, Ingo, to bring your uh, insight and intellect to bear on this problem. I knew that we would benefit from it. So thank you for those comments. I'd like to, you know, as we go, I'd like to go ahead and give each of the other participants a chance to make some points, and then why don't we go ahead and I'm making some notes here, and, and I will try to facilitate the discussion uh, of question, and also, of course, try to bring uh, you into this discussion as well, if you'll write down some some, some questions for me or some observations. Um, and then uh, just, you know, bring them up, or uh, maybe one of you can deputize yourself to be the the, the person to bring up the questions. So, Jan, if I could, do you have some, some comments on, on what I've said? And feel free to refer, of course, to, to Ingo's comments as well, if you like. Sort of an opening statement, if you will. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks so much again to give me the floor. If that's working, yeah. Um, what I would also appreciate if, is if, if, if Ingo agrees to have later on his comments and his because he, he prepared a wonderful speech, so it could be interesting to have his lecture because he's dealing with the issues you just mentioned partly. Um, well, I, I try to screen the text. I don't know, I'm, I'm professor of law, so uh, unfortunately we have to be as accurate as possible um, reading this text. And, and I have several comments, article by article, but that will probably be for a second reading. Um, just uh, one example, you are using uh, family in, uh, you are defining family in five different, with five different notions. Um, it is, is it a group? Is it an institution? Is it a unit? Is it a unit group? Is it so, you're using for one, one term, family, five different, so the, the text should be should be coherent, made to be coherent. but that's, that's on the grammatics of the text. Um, but the first question is dealing with principles, principles, real principles. 
Um, we, we should start a workshop on, on the term principles, because it can be an inspiring document. But um, yeah, principles mean that you have to, to, be, to have a broad scoop. It cannot just be limited to one region, uh, US or, or, or Europe or Asia. It should be relevant for all legislators worldwide. It should be a universal principle, right? And dealing with universal fundamental rights. Um, that means that not just for geographical reasons, but also for content-linked reasons, uh, the text is uh, too narrowly limited to defenders of home education. Of course, that, that's a starting point. But um, I'm, as you know, I'm a believer of freedom of education. And I did, did not mention once, once the term freedom of education. And according to my lecture, my legal, constitutional, and comparative education law perspective, home education could be, could be a very powerful instrument realizing freedom in society education freedom. Um, so using these terms, and then again, that will open a large um, series of, of, of legal documents, there are mostly 30, 35 uh, international documents dealing with, with, with education rights and rights of education. So you, you, you sh should be indeed more, more ambitious to some extent. Um, second point is this idea of balances, balances between um, the prior right of the parents and the so-called, to some extent, autonomous right of the child from a certain age. A lot of jurisprudence, um, Europe-wide, is mentioning that from a certain age, yes, the, the child has an autonomous right, well, quasi-autonomous right, should, should be, anyway, involved in the whole decision process on what is his future. Is that his choice? Not just within schools, but also outside school system. So a balance between parental and children's rights and the rights of, of uh, the society. You are using the term civil society uh, on, on one rare place, one just, just once. Civil society is, a, again, a very strong argument pro homeschooling or home education. The, the third sector, not the state, not the market, but the third sector. That means civil society who can take up some responsibility um, in the public interest, not private for private, but um, projects uh, in, in, the, in the interest of parents and of families, uh, but who are recognized as of general interest. So that could be also a perspective more prominently um, reflected in, in your text. Another general idea, and I will, uh, I will, I will stop, um, is <clears throat> mentioning this morning um, not just the new era of, of, of uh, new technologies and, and uh, distance learning and uh, the new way of, of learning, interactive, could be a very powerful reason, argument also to, to add um, this, and chiefly also my, my first remark this morning on learning outcomes. So not school oriented, but um, learning outcomes based. And that again is a strong argument because referring to excellent scores of, of home school families, uh, they are doing very well. And I, I wanted to quote this morning um, a, a European court decision, admiring efforts of parents who engaged themselves in homeschooling. To be honest, that, that is a commitment, that is an engagement um, of a very high level with high moral authority but also with the highest expertise, I do not believe that many, many parents can, can cope with, with this. It is so highly profiled in commitment, in engagement, 
um, in professionalism. So we have to honor. <laughs> we, we have to, and one word I, I wanted to, to read in that is trust. The state should trust, society should trust those parents who are making a huge effort. You, not, not, not just the moms, but also the dads, also the, the, so the, the parents as such. I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed by the, the good examples, and there are many good examples of, of homeschoolers um, among parents. Chapeau. So uh, the word trust. But trust, of course, so head off. Head off, yeah. head off. Chapeau yeah. <laughs> is French, as you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so the, the term trust. Uh, but of course, trust, and that's the question of balance, uh, should be proven to some extent. So again, the idea of accountability, and there the wide range of legal frameworks. As you mentioned, but again, I had no time this morning. Um, Mike, in, in the book I published with Charles Glenn, Finding the Right Balance Between Autonomy, Respons Accountability, and Freedom, uh, he mentioned quite correctly that, that there is a wide range of, of legal systems dealing with homeschooling, from no regulation, sorry for the term, no regulation to weak, to less, to, to, to more, to detailed, to over detailed, and to, to strict refusal. So there's a wide range. Um, so, but and, and you mentioned also that most systems do monitor to some extent, and I gave some examples, some good examples, I guess, of the balanced approaches on, on this monitoring. So um, I, yes, you mentioned in your principle five, litera D, please take your text, while meeting the minimum standards as may be laid down or approved by the state. So that, that, that's good. <laughs> That's good. First, there are minimum standards, and there again, we should now open a workshop on what the, oh, oh, should the state legislate? Minimum standards, according to four or five principles, what does that mean, minimum? I have a clear legal uh, answer to, to this. Uh, but also, and that, is, I mean, again, missing this term, and that was in my speech this morning, I guess, um, one of the hat ideas, namely, alternatives. The state cannot refuse alternatives who are proven to reach quality level and the learning outcome um, outputs. So uh, that are four or five general critical remarks, but again, a uh, good job, but we are still to work on it. I, am I on here? Test, OK. Thank you. Um, I cannot tell you how excited and privileged uh, I feel we are at this conference to have both of you here. Um, you, do not, you may not realize how distinguished these gentlemen are, but they are among the most distinguished thinkers in education law in all of Europe and in the entire world, in my opinion. And to have them applying their intellect to this problem is tremendous. Uh, opportunity for the global home education movement. So, you know, I'm just, you know, delighted, absolutely delighted to have you here. And I'd like to turn the floor over to my, my friend, our host, Alessandri, for his opening statement. Well, I would like to thank also our professors. And uh, I'm also delighted with the the remarks, and uh, I can say that uh, uh, I'm learning a lot here uh, since the, the beginning of the day. And, uh, you know, I remember right now an old book from Norberto Bobbio when he said that, uh, okay, all the right, human rights are declared, we just need to apply them. I think he said more or less like this. And uh, this is, was a remarkable little book, uh, the, the Age of the Rights. And uh, now I think kind of different, differently from him. Yes, uh, the rights are declared. But uh, as we see, as we saw in this experience of writing these and analyzing, the human rights treaties and the human rights declarations, uh, 
we are still in the work of declaring human rights. Uh, I think that uh, we, we are facing the danger of a very textualist approach to the human rights treaties. Uh, to think that the human rights are just this expressly written in these treaties. And uh, what uh, I saw when searching, researching and writing uh, on this declaration is that uh, uh, we are in the new frontier of human rights, that uh, human rights have not stopped to be declared. In fact, we have a lot of implicit and I must say, how can I say, invisible human rights that are uh, inside the text and must be uh, joined with an other human rights in, that are expressed in the text for us to, uh, to have a very current position. So we still have a problem of, uh, of language, of discovering the meaning, and, uh, and of this discovering the evolving meaning of human rights. So, if I can compliment Norberto Bobbio, I would say, okay, we declared, but we are still declaring that there are potential human rights that are in place in the text, and uh, they can be very important for the people also. And uh, this is a very challenging tax, uh, task in my country because we don't have a culture of human rights here. In fact, if you saw the court decisions, it's, it's not often that you see a direct reference to a human rights treaty. In, in fact, uh, I saw uh, an international research that said that Brazil is among the, the countries whose judiciary has the least citations to human rights treaties. And uh, uh, this challenging means to us here, uh, Brazilians, means joining the human rights treaties and our local constitution. Uh, in fact, uh, I can't see the constitution and the human rights treaties as different documents, materially speaking. In fact, we know that uh, the greatest uh, aim of the constitutions is to guarantee human dignity, is to guarantee human rights, and they must be interpreted together. It's what we are trying to do this. And uh, trying to, to answer one of the questions raised about uh, children's rights. Well, Brazil, as almost all the countries of the world, except one, has signed the Convention on the Rights of the Children. I'm not saying that uh, this was the best of the, or the worst option, but we have signed. And uh, that means that uh, the best interest of the child trumps all other interests. Uh, we have to consider the parents' rights. We have to consider even the state's interest, for example, uh, for a good quality of education, uh, formation of the labor market, uh, for civic education. We have to recognize that states might have some interest in education. We have to recognize that the parents have strong interest and natural interest in the education of their children. I think it's undeniable. But first of all, in the center of everything is the best interest of the child. Uh, 
In our constitution, we say that uh, the uh, child must have integral protection, not only by the state, but also by the family and by the society. And uh, it always makes sense for, for us, after the ratification of the treaty, to talk about parental rights if we talk jointly about children's rights. In fact, that's no meaning in treating one another as completely different kinds of rights. Uh, I must say that uh, we give rights to the parents. Uh, the strongest reason to give rights to the parents is that they are in the best position to see and to fulfill the best interest of the child. And we strongly believe that uh, the school, as an institution, as we know nowadays, is in a much weaker position to know, to understand, and to fulfill the best interests of the children. OK, that's it for now. Excellent. Okay, it takes a few seconds for the signal to go from here to there. <laughs> it's probably because it's going through the U.S. over to Switzerland and then back here. Okay, wow, uh, such great discussion. Uh, really some very thought-provoking commentary here. Uh, just to go back through some of the things that were said. Um, Ingo, you know, talking about the rights of the child and why, why did we base the, the, U, the Rio principles on the UN de uh, d uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights? Why not the UNCRC? I would note that the UNCRC is cited in the Rio principles, particularly in, in principle eight. And I will tell you just by way of, um, just by way of authorship, we decided we were not gonna exhaustively cite to every authority uh, especially where we thought it was obvious where the authority was. For example, you could criticize us for saying uh, principle two, best interest of the child. I mean, why don't we cite the UNCRC? Well, <laughs> because that's the whole premise of the UNCRC and it's, you know, everybody knows that's where it is. Perhaps we should have cited it, but that was the drafting principle that uh, we kind of were operating on a little bit. We're not, weren't going to cite every single um, treaty everywhere it applied, uh, just for the sake of efficiency. But uh, I appreciate very much the point, though, and I hope we can engage in this discussion because I heard Alexandre talking about this best interest of the child, and I heard, I know that Ingo is interested in this, uh, analyzing this as well. Um, we heard from, um, from Jan the idea that home education fits within this alternative education paradigm, and why not, why not fit home education into that paradigm of alternative freedom of education as opposed to, you know, is it its own thing? And I would say that I think that it does fit in that broader, uh, broader uh, heading of, of freedom in education and alternative education and that I think we in this movement should, should seek to make common cause more with the, the, the schools that are trying to be free also because we share a common interest in being free from being, you know, being interfered with by the state. We, uh, Jan also talked about balancing, which contrasts with something that um, Alessandri said, which is rights as trumps. Now, we're not going to have a big John Rawls, uh, you know, Dworkin conversation here about rights and what are rights and rights as trumps and rights as interests and, you know, bringing, you know, Raz and everybody here. We're not going there. Uh, although it would be fun to do that, I have to say. It would be very, a lot of fun to do that. But I think there's an interest. Rights as trumps, meaning rights are these things that you just sort of, you know, it's, it's your get out of jail free card. I have a right, therefore I get it. Whereas Jan is observing there's a balancing here. And I, I think Alshani would admit there's some balancing that occurs here as well. That's a, a discussion that the human rights community has on Trump's and rights and how you, how you balance and how you achieve um, human rights. And uh, uh, I really enjoyed and appreciate what Jan had to say about trust. The state should trust society and the parents. And when it when it refuses to trust, what does that mean? What does that show? I'm curious 
if you might explore that a little bit more. Um, Alishandri, you know, I'm having a little trouble here as an American because, you know, you said, um, um, you know, we have to look beyond the text. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and I'm, and I'm an American textualist, a constitutional, you know, when it comes to interpreting rights, I look to the American Constitution and the text of it, and that's, you know, and so I do see rights as trumps a little bit, and uh, I do, you know, there is balancing that does happen in our American system, and yes, it is true that we have not signed the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, I don't think we really have time to go into that here, but it's an interesting discussion nonetheless. But I think this idea of human rights and textual uh, examination brings up an interesting point. Um, so, some very interesting, so maybe I could just, uh, if I could throw it back over to Ingo to talk about, he, he's ready to talk about this idea of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, rights, how does the rights of the child call for home education as, uh, would you call it a right, home education? Um, you do not want to cite uh, the CRC, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, in this document, but I think it's very important to read to you this little article, because it's very unusual, this article, in law. <clears throat> it's the um, Article 3 of the uh, Convention the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child. In all actions concerning children, whether undertaken by public or private social welfare institutions, courts of law, administrative authorities, or legislative bodies, the best interests of the child shall be a primary consideration. A primary consideration this is, these are the two words you have to keep in mind. There is no document in international law and in human rights where it is said that the interest of a certain group or the interest of a person shall be of primary consideration. Particularly, there is no human right which says the parents' rights shall be of primary consideration. This means that the rights of the children are much stronger in international law than the parents' rights. And therefore, my position is that the, human, uh, the homeschooling movement should move over from the parents' rights interests to the children's children interest, because it's a stronger position in law and might be also in politics. Can you keep this? Thank you. Just keep it turned up. I'll turn it off when I'm not using it. Um, so does it have to be one or the other? Can it be both? Because when you look at the International Covenant on Economic Social Rights, the um, ICCPR, the ICESCR, you do see very declaratory statements about the rights of parents. And I don't want to, I'm not trying to create a tension or a, well, it should be this or it should be that. In my view, maybe it's both. Um, and more than just the two of them, but some other considerations as well. But I want, there are some very strong statements of parents' rights, uh, and not only in those documents, but also in the uh, European Social uh, Charter, where it not only talks about moral uh, or religious and philosophical conviction, but it also talks about pedagogical convictions of the parents. So I wonder, is it one or the other? Can it be both? It must be both. It cannot be otherwise, because you have both rights in the international declarations, and very often is it like this, that you have uh, different rights which sometimes can be contradictory. Mostly, of course, they are not. Look at the employer and the employee, and the function of the law and the function of the lawyers is to mitigate, to make the rights of one side and the other side live together in the social context. Therefore, I think it's completely outdated to say, like homeschooling people sometimes do, on the one side you have the nice parents, and on the other side you have the bad state. That's outdated. It's not normal. Normally, uh, the function of politics, the function of law, is to find a solution for possible conflicts. And uh, it is, from a legal point of view, wrong 
to say that on the one side there are the parents' right and the ch rights of the children are protected by the state. This is not true in law. It is true that it is the function and the task of the parents to define the children's rights. First, the parents and then the state. If the parents fail, only then the state is allowed to define the, the interest. So it is wrong to, to talk about this opposition from the beginning. There is no opposition because the position of the parents is very strong. I'd like to bring Yohan in here and also strong. Shandri because yeah. I, I, I appreciate what you're saying. I think there's a lot to what you're saying. You know, I, uh, maybe not in the first instance do we talk about the state versus parents, but in some places we have to because the reality is the state is, is acting and so they're acting against the parents and they're not trusting the parents. Germany is a great example of this. Sweden, another example of this, where you know it is the state versus the parent, um, because the state is not respecting the parents' rights, and they're inter and they're not allowing the parents to do something. What Jan, which Jan says, they should, they must trust the parents. So Jan, what do you think about this? But but I would would nuance to some extent. Um, there is some some jurisprudence like like. Oui, 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 voilà. um, there are several court decisions of your of European Court um, mentioning the prior the primary responsibility of the parent vis-à-vis -vis the that is also French vis-à-vis vis-à-vis -vis, um, vis -vis the the, um, the the education process of the child. Primary responsibility lies in parents' hands. Um, indeed, children's interest, interest of the child, is the overall principle. And by the way, there is interesting jurisprudence of the European Court. I see that the first and second paragraph in the article, no person shall be denied the right to education, and the state shall be in function respect. Uh, that um, there is the could. There should be no contradiction between both. So um, enabling parents to educate the child according to their philosophical, ideological, religious beliefs and convictions um, is, is to some extent a functioning um, right for the education of the child. But there should be not a contrast. So I, I totally agree with, with, with Ingo. Um, it, it, both are, are combined. And I would warmly plead also for using, using both parts. Um, because they are, let's say, the, the both sides of the same coin, namely education of the child. Alexandri, you have some thoughts on this, this question? Or something else you want to uh, comment about? Uh, yes, and um, I don't know, I, I think I, I agree more with our European friends than with my American friend in, in this issue, uh, mostly because our European legal heritage. Uh, you know, we must consider family uh, a structure whose one of the fundamental functions is the protection of the human rights of children. And we must consider this in the light of the principle of subsidiarity. That means that if the family isn't protection, protecting the human rights of the children in, in a minimum level, the state can interfere. There is a threshold here. It's difficult to define that threshold. But uh, yes, it's possible for the state to interfere. And uh, as you were saying, I think everybody here is saying more or less the same. We all agree that uh, are a very strong complement com complementarity between parents' rights and children's rights. But uh, I really think that the parents' rights compared to children's rights are much more instrumental. So parents have rights 
powers, responsibilities. Uh, we have all these uh, definitions uh, under their children, exactly to protect the children's rights. Uh, in some cases, we can see autonomous parents' rights. For example, the parents' rights to, uh, to teach their children according to their religious and philosophical uh, convictions. I think this is a very strong parent right against the interference of the state, the negative right, and that has not to be directly, it's not directly vinculated to a children's rights. I want to, uh, <clears throat> and we're, we're feeling our way here to figuring out if homeschooling or home education is a right. Now, as Ingo, Ingo said earlier, that's only 50% of the battle. And in fact, the German Constitutional Court thinks everything is a right, at least under uh, uh, you know, the understanding of proportionality, where you have a right to feed birds in the park, or you have a right to uh, ride your horse through a field, but just because it's a right, it doesn't mean that you get to do it, right? Ingo? <laughs> yeah. And so, 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 you know, we have examples, uh, we have some important examples here we need to talk about because in Europe and in Germany, you know, it's, home education is not treated as a right, whereas in most other places where it is recognized, it is treated as some kind of a right. It may have some minimal oversight from the state or it may not have any oversight, but it is permitted, it is allowed, it is tolerated, it is a choice that parents have. And I want to explore this because how can something be a, hum a right but not be allowed? Can you help us understand that a little bit from the German perspective? I think we're talking about, you know, a little bit, a little quick instruction on this. You know, the European Court of Human Rights has said it's okay for Germany to ban homeschooling completely, 100%. Now, Germany does allow, I will say, parents in some situations to educate their children at home, but it's under very strict circumstances when they're sick or they have other very limited circumstances and there's um, some kind of curriculum has to be used and it's very usually very, the state is very hands-on. But for parents who are philosophically or religiously motivated, it's not allowed. How do we, how do we make sense of this? Oh, that's very easy. Sorry. Uh, take the example of uh, riding a horse uh, in the field or in the woods. And it's a real, it's a uh, constitutional court. It's I think it's not turned hold on. on a, hold on a second, Ingo. We're, we're not getting you. Is it, put, can you push? Is she, okay, red light on. There we go. Go ahead. So uh, the right to ride a horse in the woods uh, is a fundamental right. I don't know what's the human right, but it's a fundamental right in the German constitution. And there's a famous court decision of Karlsruhe on this issue, because there was a gentleman who wanted to ride everywhere in the woods, and there was a farmer who did not want this gentleman to ride, uh, that this gentleman uh, 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 is uh, riding his horse in his forest. So, okay. Uh, on the one side, you have the individual right to ride a horse. But there is the uh, interest of the community that there are not horses everywhere. For instance, because nature has to be protected and horse riding can be bad for uh, the uh, the grass or the woods or whatsoever, it can be uh, uh, also a question of uh, having horses on the one side and the persons uh, uh, walking on the other side, children playing. There is some interest in some kind of regulation. This does not mean to regulate everything, but to have some kind of uh, uh, state regulation in the community interest. And uh, I think for horse riding or for mining, for instance, there's, there's a right to, to mining, of course. But there's not a right, a right to extract uh, raw material from uh, the earth everywhere. This has to be regulated for environment protection, for instance, other reasons too. Uh, we should apply this uh, to homeschooling too, this question. But the principle that you have individual rights and you have community protection by the state on the other side. This is simple and uh, cannot be doubted, I think. Well, please, Jan, please. Three 
Because of well, well known German, in German philosopher. Uh, on, on, on mm -hmm. von Jelinek, who questioned himself, what is now the most important fundamental rise in society? Chiefly, on, not just limited to periods of transition of a non-democratic regime in democracy, but just for society as such. Any doubt if it was education or religion? After all, say, well, it, it is religion, definitely, with the, the core value to determine if if a society is, is a human society. Bon, uh, anyway, we, we could start now to debate on, is it education, is it religion? It will be probably be an education and religion and some other uh, vital human rights. Um, but to my, to my mind, home education could be determined as a vital aspect of the freedom of education, freedom of education, but is a very vital fundamental right in society indeed. Second remark, um, who will judge, appreciate first what is in the best interest of the child? It is a parent. Mm -hmm. But from certain, uh, certain perspective, the best interest of the child has also so a kind of an autonomous um, vitality, uh, autonomous reading, autonomous implementation. And when it is quite clear that when parents are misusing their rights, or when there are no parents at all, the legal guardians issue, well, it, it should be the society and then the state, it was in previous time, it was the church or it was religious groups, but now it, then it will be the state who has to, to take a part of the responsibility and to go uh, translate, let's say, the content of what is the best interest of the child. And after a certain age, when, when there is some uh, room for discretion from, from the child, yes, the child has definitely also a say in what, what will be his uh, education, education future. And third remark, there are four or five arguments, according to human rights discourse, that the right to education is a very prior fundamental right in society. Um, one of the reasons is that it is a precondition of the fulfillment of most other fundamental rights. And there's a quite interesting court uh, decision in South Africa, South Constitutional Court, Then, yes, it, it right to education is very close to the right to life. Mm -hmm. So what was mentioned also this morning. Um, well, if that is true, and we, we are pleading for it, we are researching on it, and we are repeating it time after time, right to education is a very prime fundamental right. So you, you, you should invest energy and capacity in the fulfillment of that education right. Now, there is no place anymore for a purely negative um, interpretation of state's role. Because it, it's a fundamental right, parents should be enabled to fulfill their fundamental. And in some regimes, home schooling parents are, 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 are subsidized, can have a grant. Uh, what, what is a positive sign of, of, of the recognition and of the estimation, high, high appreciation of the state? So that, that's a positive sign. So um, we Europeans, we, we do think in this positive interpretation of role state, um, state of, uh, role of the state, but again, as I mentioned this morning, uh, that should be limited, chiefly in education, because it's dealing with beliefs, culture, and values. That is the definition by the judge of education. Chief, chiefly for that reason, the, the state should be should be modest, ne humble, neutral. Neutral. We, well, say, we, no, say, we, we say in Rio principles. Well, we say the principle yeah. of neutrality yeah. is uh, principle four, the impartial state. I wrote. Impartial. I wrote a whole book on the principle of neutrality in education. So <laughs> we will probably uh, dedicate have another conference. Yeah. That sounds good. Alexander, you have uh, some comments to make. Uh, okay. Uh, Yes, we have to recognize that uh, in some situations there will be a clash 
between children's rights and parents' rights. And uh, uh, I see the situation, especially in Article 5 in the Convention of the Rights of the Children. If you allow me, I'll read the article uh, that says, states parties should respect their responsibilities, rights, and duties of parents or, where applicable, the members of the extended family or community, as provided by for local custom, legal guardians, or other persons legally responsible for the children to provide in a manner cons consistent with the evolving capacities of the child, appropriate direction and guidance in the exercise by the child of rights recognized in this convention. Uh, what strikes me, cause my attention here is the expression evolving capacities of the child. Isn't there more? Doesn't it say the state shall be shall be the primary determining, mm. determine whether that's the case? No, no. Is that in a different part of the? Not here, it's uh, somewhere else, okay. But elsewhere in the convention, it does talk about how it's the, the state has the responsibility to ensure that the best interests of the child are implemented. Yeah, so. Okay, continue. Uh, I think that uh, yep. sorry, this Article 5 uh, deals with a huge tension between parental rights or interests and children's rights or interests. Because uh, this concept of uh, evolving capacities is very, very, uh, no, very unique here. I think it's the the first international document that says evolving capacities of the children. And uh, as I understood, they, they mean that uh, as the children go old, get more mature intellectual and emotional maturity, they must have more autonomy. And more autonomy can clash with the rights of the state, can clash with the rights or interests of the parents. I can, uh, I can try to exemplify that in, in our case, supposing that uh, a 12-year-old girl that w was all of her life homeschooled and uh, has a strong decision to go to school. I think that in this peculiar case, uh, it's not common, but... Uh, it's not common, but it does happen. Yeah, it does happen. I, I really think that we don't have option here. In this peculiar case, we must uh, respect the will of the, the girl because, uh, let's say, she's 12 year old, he, she has capacity to, to understand, he, send, he has some intellectual, uh, emotional maturity, and uh, in this case, we are probably going against the parents' interest in the education of the child. Go ahead, please use the microphone, Jan. Please, please. And I want to make a comment on that too. That it is against the interest of the parents. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, and you, you could quite correctly use the term instrumental. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's... The goal is not the fulfillment of the happiness of the parent. To some extent it is, but the chief goal is the happiness and the development and, and the learning process of the child. Mm -hmm. So uh, should should be, well, probably there are some tensions and, uh, in, in some cases between parents and, and children. And in some jurisdictions, national jurisdictions, it is after the age of 14. Uh, or 16, when the child is invited to, to um, deliver comments or can co-decide if it will be religious instruction or moral instruction. Mm -hmm. If it will be that school or another school. It will be follow that uh, optional course. Oh, so, but it can be 12, it can be 13, it can be 14. Anyway, it, it is up to the judge, unfortunately, when, when these tensions cannot be compromised. Well, sometimes these, these tensions are adjudicated for by law. Ingo, you'll be, you'll be right after this. But, you know, I mean, 12 years old seems to me a very tender age at which to consign the parents. Um, and, I, and I see parents 
exercising, I think of it as parents exercising discretion and exercising the rights of the child in their minority when the child is not really capable of understanding how to exercise their own rights. You know, you may have a 12-year-old homeschool child who thinks it's best for them to go to school, but maybe it's not. You're going to let a year old girl decide that she's ready to go to this school or to, instead of going to the Catholic Church, go to this Baptist Church or become a Mormon or just become an atheist and just not go to church at all. So it becomes a question of line drawing. Now we're starting to draw lines. At what point do we allow the state to intervene? And now, Ingo, it becomes a question of the state versus the parent in determining what's in the best interest of the child. And that's the difficulty. Please, go ahead. Make your comment about that or whatever you want. I can't, you can't see it here, whether it's on or not. It is on, yes. Uh, I think this notion of the evolving or the growing capacity of the child is a ve indeed a very important notion, a legal notion, and it's indeed new. Uh, in German civil law, we have it now for 25 years, and at that time, 25 years ago, it was pretty new, and most lawyers said, oh, what's this? It's flu, it's growing capacity or evolving capacity. What is it? It's uncertain, it's unclear, it, uh, you cannot decide on it. But uh, as time goes by, I think, uh, as many other legal expressions uh, which are very open to, becomes by jurisprudence more uh, concrete and more uh, defined. Behind this is a very fundamental question of human rights, uh, or fundamental rights, because there is no document uh, in constitutional law which says every child has the right, the fundamental right, to decide on his own, on, his on the interests and on its rights. Uh, mm -hmm. There is the option that uh, until age 18 or 21 or whatsoever, the parents have to say what is in the best interest of the child. Mm -hmm. And then there's the so-called children's movement, uh, people which are now very active, sometimes very aggressive, and they say uh, there is a fundamental right from age zero. Mm -hmm. And of course then everybody says, what kind of nonsense <laughs> is this? You cannot see <laughs> toddlers going to the voting cabin and vote for political parties. And here, the children's movements have a very interesting argument. They say the capacity to make use of your uh, human rights is shown if you go to the voting cabin. This shows that you are capable to do so, mm. not only to walk, but also to sign. Um, so, and this dispute between zero and 18 or 21, it depends on the countries, there is a kind of mediating uh, theory, and they say the capacity or the right of the children begins with its capacity. So, th just one sentence. Yes, please, they please, say please, please. Uh, for freedom of opinion, this begins uh, when children can speak. And on the other hand, the freedom to vote uh, must be fixed by the legislator. Uh, and there must be some general regulation. You can't say uh, it's uh, like um, uh, these um, children's movement people do. It's open to everybody. The, at least it will be difficult. I could talk about this more, but I will not. So, but there is state decision on the age for voting. And so it depends. And I think uh, if we take it seriously, that children have the right to make use of their fundamental rights depending on their capacity to do so, we should respect this. The parents must respect this too, and this is in civil law. In civil law, the parents have to respect this going capacity, evolving capacity. And uh, the parents are still the first to make the decision. You see, they decide. Uh, on my will as a parent, or I respect the will of the children. So they are in the 
first position. And only then the state can say, no, 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 that's not correct. We interfere. We have about seven minutes left. So if anybody has a question they want to bring up here, now would be the time to do it. Um, speaker, forever hold your peace. You know, the concern that I have a little bit about this evolving capacities doctrine, which we have in the U.S. a little bit when it comes to custody decisions. Um, you know, the best interest of the child standard is a standard that we have in the United States that we only use in divorce court, essentially. Uh, when there is a dispute between the parents, then the state may get involved um, to, to, to discuss this. Oh boy, well I'm sorry, I've just been given a tome of questions. I'll see what we can do here in just a moment. I'll toss this off to you, Alexandri. But, uh, you know, and so I'm uncomfortable with uh, handing the rights, the rights, handing the, uh, um, the decision-making capacity from the parent to a judge. Why should a judge be able to decide this instead of the parent? Well, in case of conflict, right. Well, um, and, and sometimes, no, no, I think the parents decide first is a very good, I think that's an excellent way of looking at it. It's an excellent way of looking at it. And then it becomes a question of when and how does the conflict manifest and at what point does the judge intervene? And the problem is that often, and we see these cases in the United States where children sue their parents for college tuition, or they sue their parents because they don't have enough time playing video games, or they sue their parents because they're, they're, they don't want to go to church anymore. Yes, yes. Uh, we teach our children to litigate at a young age. Okay. So, so anyway. So I appreciate. I but I appreciate. I think you know, Ingo. You put you put it very clearly. Either children have rights, or they don't until they're 18. Or um, there has to be some other way of determining when they are able to exercise their in, in nascent right. And you put out there the idea that well, when they have physical capacity. But then I ask myself, well, you you may have physical capacity to do something, but does that mean you have the mental capacity to do so? No, of course not. Jan says no, and I agree. So let me let me bring on Alexandre into this conversation. We've got about five minutes left, and I'll see if I can pull a couple of questions out of this. Go ahead. And, uh, and one more thing, we're going to wrap up, and each of you are going to say, yes or no, home education is a right. <laughs> I want to put you on record, if you're willing to go on record. Freedoms are our rights. Okay, you can, you can try to nuance it if you like. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, actually, I just want to kind of uh, correct my previous statement. Uh, I, I cannot say for sure, in theory, that a 12-year-old girl is able to do this decision because uh, thinking better, it's not a theoretical matter. It's a practical issue that must be decided in each case dependent on the person's physical, mental, emotional, and intellectual maturity. That's that. Thank you. I think we've hit a few of these that uh, we have here. One, uh, you know, who determines the primary consideration of the child? I think we've had a, a discussion about that. Um, you know, what is a right? Um, that would, I mean, that's something people, there's a hundred people who've written books on the decisions of rights and what's a right? Is it a positive right? Is it a negative right? Do I have a right to public education? Do I have a right to uh, be left alone? These are, you know, these are questions and we don't have time to get into those, but it's a good question. Um, when does a parent's right supersede a child's right? We just had a bit of a conversation about that. Um, okay, let's see. So someone writes, it should be the case that everything is allowed except those things that are explicitly forbidden by law. Why does the Rio Declaration require the explicit recognition of home education? I guess in the interest of time, I'll stop there. And I'm sorry, I told you guys to bring your questions up sooner and you didn't. So I'm sorry about that. We're not gonna be able to get into that because I want to respect your coffee break. And we have three minutes left and we have four people who need to wrap up. So here's the question. Um, is home education a human right? or not. And we will start, we'll go from the right to the left, and so that means I get to finish. As, as I mentioned, um, well, we uh, talked on um, the negative uh, content of rights, uh, of the positive uh, content of, of fundamental rights. So according to my opinion, because freedom is rights, as I mentioned just a couple of seconds ago, 
And as I try to clarify that home education is an aspect of the freedom of education uh, and linked to the right to education, you could consider it as a vital aspect of the freedom of education and thus from that perspective as a right. Home education is a human right of the parents and the child. Uh, and like all human rights can be restricted by state, by the legislature, and sometimes it must be restricted. An excellent statement of the German position. Unfortunately, the courts got it wrong, though. They need some education, Ingo. Please, go ahead, Jan. Restriction, the most accurate. Uh, monitored, con con conditioned, um, no. Uh, not con but um, it's unconditional. It's rights are unconditional. Yeah, restricted in the German perspective. I think restricted is exactly the right word. Yeah. In in the German constitutional jurisprudence of proportionality, everything is a right, but it may be restricted proportionally, and that's I think he's he's exactly right. That's the German position, and well, very well stated. Um, well, I'm very partial to say that, but uh, yes, uh, it's a human right. And uh, I'll just answer very quickly one question. If it, it is a human right, why we need to, to do this, the real principles? Well, because you know there are dozens of declarations of human rights, and uh, they are not always so obvious. Uh, we, we cannot see at first sight all the rights and uh, in the human rights treaties, and uh, sometimes they are, um, they are controversial, and uh, sometimes we need to write a declaration to wrap this out and try to explain the consistence and even the existence of this right. Excellent, well said. And of course, it will be no surprise to anybody here that the Director for Global Outreach at the Home School Legal Defense Association, believes that home education is a right. I believe that it is a constitutional right under the American system. I believe that it is a human right under the international human rights system. Um, and I would add to what Alexander has said, um, we ex explicate, we explicate the right to advance the freedom. Uh, the real principles uh, is necessary because not everyone agrees with the very four distinguished guests we have here who all agree with each other. <laughs> but because there are many people who disagree with this view. Uh, and, uh, and I know that I think that Ingo would say that while home education is a right and it may be restricted to a certain extent, I, 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 you would disagree with the German court's position in, for, in forbidding it? You think they're wrong? Yes, I'm asking, do you think the German constitutional court is wrong in forbidding home education? I think under constitutional law, there must be exceptions. And the, court, the court did not allow exceptions, and this was wrong. Okay, that's, I'll take that. The court didn't allow enough exceptions for home education. Fine. Um, okay, so I want to thank, uh, so we need to, we, need to, we need to use documents to convince people. We have to persuade people. We do that by having conferences and, and, and discussing these things. We do that with individuals one-on-one. -on -one. We do that in our small communities from the very uh, smallest community, our next door neighbor who might call the social workers because our kids are playing outside and being loud in the yard. This happened in Florida and they called the police. It's a lawsuit now in America, <laughs> uh, and uh, or uh, up up to the to our national legislatures, even to the United Nations, because every person, every family, every child, every parent should be able to enjoy the freedom to homeschool their children. With that, we will close our session on is home education a human right? Uh, you all get to have a nice coffee break. Um, and enjoy the food, please enjoy the coffee. Please uh, talk to our sponsors. Lee Borton is here, one of our sponsors with Classical Conversations. We have the Heckies who are here, uh, also one of our sponsors. Uh, Grandparents Homeschooling, Gerald is here with uh, HSLDA Canada, one of our sponsors. So if you have the chance to thank them. And I also would like to just, if you don't mind, Sugata Mitra, our keynote speaker, is here. Sugata, we're glad to have you here. Sugata Mitra from uh, Newcastle. Uh, coming from India, and we're very much looking forward to hearing you uh, talk tomorrow about uh, education and your research and your findings. So please enjoy your coffee, enjoy your conversation. Thank you for being here. And we're going to continue this conversation a little bit more uh, at 4 o'clock um, at um, uh, another con I think we're just going to, I'm going to try and get all these guys to come with me so we'll continue this conversation on the state's role 
and regulating home education. So if you're interested, come to that workshop. And I'm not sure where it is, but just look at the signs and we'll perhaps we'll see you there. Thank you again. So uh